all things new, hope, the revelation of King Jesus. We are barreling towards the end of this thing. Um, we are going to be in the book of Revel- or, sorry, in uh, chapters 21 and 22 for the next three weeks, today and the next two weeks, uh, kind of looking at the end of the book of Revelation here. Uh, well, C.S. Lewis, uh, in the book Weight of Glory, says this. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. I've quoted this before. This is a a pretty meaningful quote for me personally. But the question that I have for us this morning and for what does it mean uh, as we look at the end of the book of Revelation is what is the offer of a holiday at sea that he's speaking of? What actually is God offering to his children? What's the thing that he's holding out for us? And is it better than other things? Is it really better? That's really what we're going to be looking at. Revelation 21 and 22 give us a vivid description, uh, maybe the most vivid description of this holiday at sea, this thing that God has offered us. What is it that God is going to do for his people? It's two of my favorite chapters in all of the scriptures. I know I say that every week, but Two of my favorites for sure. And so, uh, but, but the reality is, our problem is exactly what C.S. Lewis says, is that we are far too easily pleased. We are too quick to make our home this place. This place in which we live now. We're too quick to make it our true home, to be too satisfied with the things of this world. As though the things of this world can really satisfy the longings of our heart. We get too enthralled with them and we forget where our true home lies. Or sometimes, if that's not where we land, sometimes we land in the opposite place in which we forget the person at the center of our true home. It really becomes about longing for heaven Because of the things of heaven and not because of the person at heaven. Longing for just the same things that we want in this life that we just don't get. We just think, okay, we'll just wait for those things later. And we still are wanting the things of this world and not Jesus. And so in the midst of that, we actually try to escape this world rather than serve and love our neighbors like Jesus. So the question is, how do we kind of strike a balance between those things? One of our core values as a church is to serve this city and seek the city that is to come. And that comes from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 12 through 16. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You see, the author to Hebrews says here that the way in which we are to serve the city is to recognize that this city is not our lasting home. But we seek the city that is to come. But you see, in the midst of that, when he says we seek the city that is to come, he does not say, therefore, hide in a bunker until the city comes. He says, don't neglect to do good and to share. Go actually where Jesus is right now, suffering outside the camp. Go and suffer in loving your neighbor and your enemy, because this is not our lasting home. We are waiting for our lasting home. And that's really the whole book of Revelation, right? That's the whole thing. Because Jesus is king and is glorious, act like the church, serve like Jesus, not like Babylon, and wait for this coming city. 
So that's what we're going to seek to do. Serve the city and seek the city that is to come. And over the next three weeks, we're going to look at really the heart of who we are as a church and the heart of Christian theology, in my opinion. That what does it mean to serve the city and seek the city that is to come? So we're going to look at this. Really, essentially what I've done is write, uh, you know, because I'm getting close to sabbatical, so I'm just writing one sermon and splitting it into three, okay? So, uh, because I'm pretty tired already. No, (laughs) I'm just kidding. Uh, There's just so much here. We could just spend months here in this section. But, so we're really going to look at one overarching theme and kind of break it into three spots. So we're going to look this morning at the glory of Jesus in the physical new heavens and new earth. Next week, we'll look at the glory of Jesus in the reverse of the curse. And finally, we'll look at the glory of Jesus in bringing us home, the real theme of the whole section. So, we're going to look at the glory of Jesus in the physical new heavens and new earth. So, starting in Revelation chapter 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children." The cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. All right, so what is this thing that we're looking at? The new heavens and the new earth. What does that mean? Well, we're going to get into all of the detail of what this means, uh, but the reality is, Uh, This is the picture, this is the final picture that John is seeing about the end of all things. When Jesus returns, what is it going to be like? And remember, the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature, so it uses a lot of figurative language. We're going to see that again and again in this way, uh, in this text. But, But this new heavens and new earth, who is it for? Who do we see it's for? Well, it's very clearly it's for the saints. Those who are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who are following Jesus. Those who, uh, at the same time, right, it's for the saints, those who are following Jesus. And yet, Jesus, the one on the throne, says, To anyone who is thirsty, I will freely give from the springs of the water of life. Just as we said last week, in looking at Revelation 20, in the judgment that comes based on the law and the things that we do, and the salvation comes not based on the law and the things we do, but just based on grace. So if you hear, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but if you hear the description of the new heavens and new earth, and you think, that makes me thirsty, I want that. Come and take it. Jesus is saying, come. This is the invitation. Just come to the new heavens and new earth. Come to me, and I will take you there. Come to Jesus. And those who are excluded from this are those who are judged by their sin. Now, the, the, the list of things that John says here in terms of uh, the, uh, the list here, where does he start? But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, all these things. This is just, it's not like these specific sins are worse than any other sins. This is just simply a summary of all the law. It's just a summary of all the law and is exactly related to all the things that uh, we saw in Revelation 20 in terms of the books being opened and being judged based upon the things in which we had done in disobedience to God. Any way that we disobey God in thought, word, and deed. Doing what he tells us specifically not to do and not doing specifically what he tells us to do in thought, word, and deed. And if we're honest... 
As we said last week, if we look at the law and we are honest with our lives, that condemns every single one of us. Multiple times over. Thank God for grace. Saved by grace. So if this is who it is for, well, when is this thing coming? Well, here's part of the key, and one of the things that we've been looking at in the book of Revelation this whole time is this idea of when is this happening? When is this coming? Well, what does the one on the throne say? He says, look, I am making everything new. One of the tensions of the entire New Testament is this idea of the already and not yet. That already Jesus has conquered. Already things are finished. Already Jesus has welcomed you into his family. Already he has given you eternal life, which is to know God and to know Jesus, right? That's what Jesus says in John, to know the Father and to know the one he has sent. That's eternal life. Already that is true of you. And yet it's not fully here yet, right? So Jesus is in the process of making all things new, right? We have experiences as believers in which we think, man, it can't get any better than this. Some experience with the Lord, some time in his word, some way in which the Lord so gently shows you his love, some fellowship with other believers, some experience in the created order that you're like, this is life. This is good. And yet almost immediately you're like, well, but it could be better, right? Because of the curse. We're going to talk about this, about how the curse is going to be reversed. But the reality is that Jesus is already making all things new. And yet it's not fully here yet. It's not fully here yet. So what will it be in the end when he does make all things new? Well, John says he saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. Now, what does that mean? Well, We don't know the details of what this means in terms of like, John's not seeing like, okay, so what I saw was a meteor that hit the earth and then, you know, it exploded or the sun burnt. We don't know. He simply says the old is gone and the new is here. Now, throughout the scriptures, Paul identifies that the resurrection of the children of God is the thing that the cosmos is waiting for, that the whole universe is waiting on you and I to be resurrected and glorified and be like Jesus. And that that's the pattern of how this will happen. So we should expect that resurrection implies some kind of death, right? And yet, is that total destruction? Well, not always, but sometimes, right? So What does it look like for the cosmos to be renewed in this? We don't have details. The old is gone and the new is here. That's what we have. Now, the resurrection of Jesus, he was new, right? I mean, he was new. He never died again. And yet, he ate fish with his disciples and his disciples knew who he was. So he was similar, right? So we should expect... We, we, we dealt with this a lot when we walked through what it means to be made in the image of God, right? We talked about the Imago Dei, what it means to be made in the image of God, and the fact that we will, in our resurrected bodies, be these bodies resurrected, right? Like God didn't make a mistake when he designed you. He designed you, and you will be you resurrected in glory. And so... We should expect that the new heavens and new earth will have some relationship with the old heavens and earth, right? It should have some familiarity, some relationship to it. And that's what we're going to see a little bit as we walk through and the physical nature of those things. But we should expect that it will be similar in some ways and yet different in others. Now, it says the sea will be no more. And so some of you are like, but man, the ocean is really nice. Like, are we sure that we're not going to have beaches and oceans? Have you ever seen a sunset over the ocean? That sounds like new heavens and new earth to me, right? Remember, Revelation is apocalyptic literature, meaning figurative language. You see, in the ancient world, the sea was not like, hey, let's go to a holiday at the sea. The sea was the place that you died, right? Like, you couldn't control the sea. 
You could not control the sea. The sea was the place in which evil dwelt. This was very common for people to have negative views of the sea. Like, how could you overcome the sea? It's unruly. You can't. Remember the disciples when Jesus is in the boat and he calms the wind and the waves? They are terrified. They think they're going to die. Now, Mark's version of that story in the gospel says, after Jesus calms the wind and the waves, they're really terrified. They're more scared when it's calm than when it's not calm because they're like, if you can control the wind and the waves and no one can, who are you? And we better watch out. We might be in trouble, guys. Like, this is, this is serious, right? If you control the sea, that's serious. So, figurative language, meaning evil is gone. Not necessarily that there's no water, okay? So chill out. There's probably going to be some water. It's probably going to be a beach that we can go hang out on, right? Okay? If you like the beach, you'll probably have a beach. So, figurative language. But this new heavens and new earth is going to be a glorious resurrection moving forward, progressing from what the Garden of Eden represented. Everything that the Garden of Eden represented and much more. John goes on to describe this new garden city. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues, remember seven's pretty important around here, uh, perfection, uh, came and said to me, come with me. I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain, and then he showed me a holy city, the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper as clear as crystal. The city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels, and the name of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. Now remember, 12 is also a really important number, right? Right? 12 is the completion of the people of God, representing the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, and we'll see that in a second. Now, again, when apocalyptic literature or when you're reading, so Revelation, or when you're reading the prophets, sometimes we try to press details too much. And we're like, what would a city of Jasper be like? Ooh, what does Jasper even look like? I don't know. Right? It's like, no, no. What John is describing is he's trying to find human language to describe something that is indescribable. He's just grasping for language to describe it's gorgeous. It's so beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So let me list all the most beautiful things I've ever seen and describe it in that way. So is the walls or is the city actually a, a precious stone? No, it's not, right? Or, or maybe it is, uh, you know, but, but likely it's not this specific stone. He's just describing in figurative language the beauty of the city landing out of heaven. And the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. This is important too. We're going to see this again in just a second. But all throughout the book of Revelation we have seen, and all throughout the New Testament, that the people of God in the Old Testament, Israel, and the people of God in the New Testament, the church, are the same people. It's not two peoples of God. We are the same people. We are gathered together. That, their story is our story. We are gathered together in the same way. And so the 12 tribes of Israel are honored in this city because we are a part of this people, right? And so now, the, that, that doesn't say anything about, uh, you know, uh, modern political states of Israel or anything like that. That's not what this is dealing with in any way, or the New Testament in any way is dealing with any of that. The reality is the church is the people of God, right? And Jew and Gentile are together invited into the people of God, right? We're invited into the same promises of God. And so this is the wholeness of the people of God in this way. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. See, we've got the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles put together here. The angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. When he measured it, he found it was a square as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. Now, 1,400 miles, you might, you're like, remember, numbers are important. So what's 1,400? Well, 
1,400 miles, miles wasn't a measurement that they used uh, when John's writing this. And so this is a modern translation that helps us understand actually what it is. But the actual Greek in here is 12,000 stadia, which is just a, a, a unit of measurement. And so, you know, his trans, the translators have moved it over to miles for us to understand. But 12,000, now that's an important number. Remember, 12 is the fullness. 1,000 is big. It's a big city. It's a big city. 1,400 miles. I did some math. It's been a while since I've done math, so just bear with me. But I did some math. It's big. It's (laughs) 1.9 million square miles is the city that John's seeing. 1.9 million square miles. Now, there's 196 million total land square miles on the earth. So there's lots of room. This isn't taking up the whole earth. You can go out and explore the mountains and do whatever you want, right? Like there's going to be more room. But if we were to take a population density of a a modern city, kind of middle of the road, big city like Chicago, something we're familiar with, right? Think of the population density of Chicago. In that size city, you comfortably fit over 20 billion people. Comfortably. Comfortably. Now, if you go with the density of a city like Mumbai, it's 140 trillion people. It's a lot of people. The estimates currently for the total number of humans who have ever lived on our planet range from 100 billion to 120 billion. So, the point of what John is seeing is, it's big enough. It's a big city. It's big enough for the whole family of God to be in the same place, in the same city, in this giant city. Then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick, according to the human standard used by the angel. Uh, That's 144 cubits, right? 144, 12 times 12, right? That's all it is, right? He's just using figurative numbers to say this is a perfect wall. Nothing's messing with this wall. The wall was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold, as clear as glass. The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysopras, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. All of these precious stones, right? These precious stones and jewels, the beauty and the extravagance. If God can make precious stones look beautiful in this place, imagine what he can do in a place with no sin. Precious and glorious. The 12 gates were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl. Now that's a big pearl. So this is why the sea is gone. Because you can, can you imagine a clam? Holding that kind of pearl? Like, wait, wait, no, we don't need to see that one, right? Like, it's a beautiful place. And the main street was pure gold, as clear as glass. I saw no temple in the city. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. This is glorious. We're going to get to this in the final week. But no temple. The whole point of the whole entire scriptures is God has created Human beings in his image, he has put them in a place in which he will dwell with them. The Garden of Eden is a temple. And Adam and Eve were meant to protect this temple and to walk with God in the coolness of the garden. To be with him. As soon as the fall happens, the rest of the story of the scriptures can be told in terms of trying to create and build a place in which God can meet with his people and maintain that while waiting for a better place. Right? That's what it always is. Get the tabernacle. Get the temple. Oh, wait, and then Jesus comes and says some crazy things about the temple. And then Paul says, you're the temple. And then in the new heavens and new earth, there's no more temple. Because God is literally dwelling with us. There's no temple. The temple and the earth are now the same, just like in the garden. Except now we're in a city, a garden city. I saw no temple in the city for the Lord God 
uh, and the Lamb are its temples. And the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. That word light is really lamp, uh, which is a glorious picture. This is one of the most glorious pictures about who Jesus is, right? You don't really see light, right? Like, as it's like between that light and here, you can't really see it. Like, oh, there it is right there, right? But, but when you look at a lamp or a bulb, you see the lights, right? It houses the light. It's Jesus in the glory of God. You can't see the glory of God. You look at the light. You look at the lamp and you see the glory of God. That's why the book of Hebrews says, right, that he radiates the glory of God. He's the radiance of his glory. That's exactly what John is describing here. That Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. He's like the lamp containing the glory of God that we get to see. The nations will walk in its light. And the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no night there. Now imagine, again, in the first century, reading this, right? The idea of night is very different than our idea of night. Night is like, well, I can do anything I want to do during the day. It's just a little less convenient. In the ancient world, you can't do that. Like, night means nothing can happen, right? Because it's dark. There's no, like, just flip a switch, right, and turn it on, right, and make this happen. No, there's real night. Here, there is no night. There's no threat of violence. There's no need to lock the door. The gate stays open because nothing can come in and mess with it. Nothing can come in and mess with it. The gates never close. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Remember, one of the things we've looked at throughout the book of Revelation is that Jesus is making a people for himself from every tribe, language, people, and nation. All of the nations... Jew and Gentile brought together all the people of God in their diversity coming into this city. In their glorious diversity. Not losing their glorious diversity. In their glorious diversity coming. As John has seen and heard all of these things. I imagine this very much as the reverse of what we saw at the Tower of Babel. In which... All of the, the people, all the languages were confused and no one could understand one another anymore. We see a beginning of that reverse at Pentecost in which they are all speaking languages and everyone's hearing their own language. I imagine that's what it's going to be like in the new heavens and new earth. I don't know that we're all going to speak the same language. And if we did, it certainly wouldn't be English. That wouldn't make any sense, right? Given the reality of uh, the, the New Testament and the history of the world. I don't think we're all going to speak the same language. I think you're going to understand everything that anyone else says, though. Right? Like, in, like, a, like an internal Google Translate, right? Like without fault, hearing the beauty of other languages, but understanding it as well. This glorious reality of the nations coming together to worship King Jesus in the city that God, descend, that God brings down on the earth. Nothing evil will ever be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry, dishonesty, but only those whose name are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. So this is where we talk about the reality of a garden city. Remember the tree of life in the garden? The tree of life that Adam and Eve, after the fall, were barred from eating from. Because it's a sacrament reserved for the people of God in the glory of God. And now, all the nations get to eat from the tree of life. All the nations get to eat from this tree. They find their healing in this tree. We get to eat from the tree of life together in the middle of the garden city, flowing with, with water flowing from it, from the throne in the Lamb. 
The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him. Next week we're going to talk almost exclusively about this verse. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. Jesus will reverse all places in which the curse has shown up. And they will see his face. And his name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night there. No need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. This is a physical place. right? John's describing things that he sees and understands as a physical reality. Remember when he describes... Uh, last week we saw during the thousand years he describes seeing the souls of those who had been beheaded. He doesn't describe seeing souls here. These are bodies. Physical bodies in a physical city. Why, why physical? Well, I don't know why God decided that this is how he should make things. But that's what he did. It's what he did. Jesus coming in the flesh affirms God's creation that he didn't make a mistake when he created the world. The new heavens and new earth is not just a spiritual reality. It is a physical reality. Now this is such good news. Friends, I remember growing up in church and thinking and hearing about heaven and hell. And hearing about heaven. And thinking like, okay, well, they talk a lot about praising Jesus. I don't particularly love singing because I'm really bad at it. But okay, that's probably going to get boring eventually. And the only descriptions I see of heaven are like, we all get a little cloud that we float on, and, and we got wings maybe, but, but can, we, can we wear some more clothes maybe? Like, this feels weird. I don't like this. That's not this. It's a city. It's a city, a garden city. It's a physical reality. It's new but it bears resemblance to the old that God created good. The ground is good. The physical is good. The bodies we have are good. They will be resurrected. All sin taken away. But we have to get out of our minds this notion that is broadly seeped into the church that the physical is bad, spiritual is good, and if we can just get out of the physical, we can get to the spiritual. It's partially why we've been focused on, on mental health in some ways, right? Is because it's like anytime you struggle in any way, people are like, well, are you praying enough? Right? We only have spiritual answers. God cares about it all. We should be praying, absolutely. I'm not saying don't pray, right? You didn't hear your pastor say don't pray, okay? But I'm saying there are more answers, God has created a, a, a world with physical things, right? And so there are more answers than just that. And the reality is that the physical is good, and we will experience it for all eternity. We will be in a physical reality. We, we could probably hike a mountain, probably hang out on a beach with a non-evil sea. We can take a nap under a tree. Can find a glorious place to set up a hammock. Can set up a paint studio. Paint. Can have conversation with friends. Eat and drink and tell stories. Tell jokes. Probably get to play some sports. I hope I can dunk. But we'll see. <laughs> probably not. Probably not. That'd be too much. That'd be too much. But this is good news. This is good news. Because here's the thing. Remember what I said earlier? When Jesus says, all who are thirsty come. If you are here and you're not a Christian, you're not trusting in Jesus, and you're not sure what you think about Christianity, part of why some people push against Christianity is because it doesn't make sense of their lives. Because it's like, why would I hope in a thing that's out there and not connected to here? And, and I actually get to experience good life out here. Well, well, what I'm saying is, God created everything out here. And so when you experience something glorious and good, it's not because you're not thinking about the God of the universe. It's because the God of the universe designed that very thing for you to enjoy. And the reality is, 
that thing, even though it taps into something glorious, it still doesn't satisfy. Because this world is broken. So we have this experience which is glorious and then like, it was close. That's not going to be our experience in the new heavens and new earth. Everything is glorious. There's no sin. There's no more curse. You get to experience the fullness of the new heavens and new earth. The fullness of this reality. And that, just the promise of that should make you very thirsty. Because this world leaves us very thirsty. But there's a river of life that we can drink from. But here's the thing. That river of life comes from a place. Comes from the Lamb. Comes from the throne. See, my thoughts as a child of like, ah, singing to Jesus is going to get boring is because I had a, a truncated view of worship, which was that just of singing. No, there's no temple there. We don't gather in the temple. Why? Because you can worship everywhere while doing anything. Because the, temp, the, the temple is the earth. The earth is the temple. We don't have to look for the sun because Jesus is everywhere. The glory of God is everywhere. You get to experience the fullness of it everywhere. The fullness of God. So what do we do in light of this? Well, we come to Jesus. Revelation 22, 12 through 17 says this, Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, they will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. Friends, stop making mud pies in the slums. The holiday at the sea is offered you. Come. This church, this bride of Christ invites you to come to Jesus. The Spirit invites you to come to Jesus. Jesus himself invites you to come to him. He is good. He will satisfy your soul. He is the glory of the physical new heavens and new earth. So come to him. Come to him and wash your robes in his blood. Receive forgiveness for your sins. Come and worship him. If you are a Christian, you're trusting in Jesus and Him alone for salvation. Friends, stop making mud pies in the slums. Come to Jesus. This is an already not yet. We already get foretastes of this. This is already ours. This reality, we get to tap into this reality already. We get to see this glory in the Scriptures, in our fellowship with one another, in prayer, in Doing the work of God in creation, in being a part of this world, in serving and loving our neighbors, all of these ways, we get to see the glory of God. So stop trying to satisfy your soul in things that will not satisfy. Stop trying to do that. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate. He suffered so that we can wash our robes, so that we can come to him and receive forgiveness of sins to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. This is the whole point of the book of Revelation, right? We join Jesus in suffering now. We join Jesus in suffering now. We love and serve neighbor and even enemy now. For here we have no lasting city. But we seek the city that is to come. This glorious new heavens and new earth, which is coming down out of heaven. So let's not neglect to do good and offer a sacrifice of praise to God. 
We love, we serve, we suffer for our neighbors because this is not our true home. And we wait for Jesus to bring it. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you now and we are waiting on this new garden city of glory. Jesus, we want it. Jesus, we are longing for you to come back. You say that you are making all things new, and Lord, we are waiting to experience it right now. We are longing to experience this new heavens and new earth. And so, Lord, would you let us be a foretaste of that for our city so that when people experience this place, they would experience something of the glory of Jesus and something of the glory of the new heavens and new earth. Would you help us not to be too easily satisfied by the things of this world, but to remain thirsty and only quench our thirst with you, King Jesus, as we long for this new city. Jesus, we need you to come. This world is broken, and we need you to renew it. So Jesus, would you come quickly? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.